Uh, good morning and welcome to the 22nd meeting in 2017 of the Standards, Procedures and Public Appointments Committee. Um, our only agenda item today is an evidence session with the Commissioner for Ethical Standards and Public Life in Scotland on his annual report. And joining us today are Bill Thoms Thompson, the Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life in Scotland, and Ian Bruce, a Public Appointments Manager, Commissioner for Ethical Standards in Public Life in Scotland. And I'd like to welcome both of you to the meeting and invite the Commissioner to make a short opening statement. Um, thanks, Convener. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to be here to discuss with you any issues that interest you in the annual report. Um, I think I have set out what I need to say about uh, 1617 in the report. Obviously, we'll be able to update you um, on what has happened since then, if the committee are interested. Um, and I'm happy to deal with questions. Thank you. Um, can I just start off then with some questions about about the report? So that uh, this report was published in October 2016. Sorry, 2017. 2017. Yeah. Apologies. Um, and there was a number of uh, key risk uh, risks for the organisation that were identified. Yeah. Um, one of which was the database. Yeah. Um, and I believe that there was a business case put together uh, with Scottish government to look at about putting in a case management system. Um, can you uh, bring the committee up to speed where, we, where we're at with that? Has that been funded? Is that in place? Uh, yes, I can, Convener. Um, we put together a, a detailed business case um, which uh, was submitted to the corporate body uh, and we received approval from the corporate body to proceed um, along with funding up to a certain limit um, earlier in this financial year. And we are about to go out to tender. Um, we have, as you'll appreciate, quite a small office. Um, we have no sp specialist IT experience, which is why we're very grateful for the support we got from the Scottish Government's um, digital wing, if you like, uh, in putting together the business case. And we are receiving support on a sort of pay-as-you-go basis um, from the Government's procurement office uh, with the actual tender exercise. Uh, the specification is almost finalised and we intend to go out in January. Um, in an ideal world, we will appoint a tenderer before the end of March. Um, it's slightly tight, I have to say, but we're, we're hoping to achieve that. And what contingency plans have you in place should the current system fail before you have a new case management system in place? Um, my answer may appear flippant, but the only contingency I have is to cross my fingers. Um, this was identified two years ago as a serious risk uh, and we've been working very hard since then um, to replace the system. Um, we could do things manually. Um, it would be very clunky and very slow. We wouldn't be able to obtain management information uh, except with a huge amount of effort. Um, and I think it would slow up the process of dealing with complaints to a degree that would be unacceptable. Um, the system is robust enough. It just was not designed to cope with the volume which it has had to deal with since it was, I think it was about 13 years ago it was developed. Um, and we don't have any backup for the IT basis for it. So um, <laughs> the person who originally developed it is still in the office, which is helpful. Um, but yeah, the risk is there, and that's why we're, we've got it as a high priority. So it was a risk that was identified two years ago, but there's still no solution in place? Well, that's true. Um, developing a business case properly is not a straightforward exercise, particularly where you don't have the IT specialism in the office. Um, and it wasn't agreed instantly by the corporate body, let's put it that way. Um, so the, the whole process uh, of developing and seeking approval for the business case took over a year. Okay, thank you. Uh, Kate. Um, and welcome this morning. There's obviously been uh, a lot of discussion and I understand that you're giving evidence to the Equalities Committee recently on the Gender Representation Bill. So, and yet on the 
whilst we're seeing a um, higher number of women board members, we're also seeing um, underrepresentation of visible minority ethnic board members, which is at its lowest level in the period covered by the annual report, and an underrepresentation of disabled people and people under the age or uh, um, underrepresentation of disabled people and people under the age of 50 increased in 2016. So I've got a bit of a cheeky question, uh, which is, has focus on gender meant that we've taken our eye off the ball on ensuring that there is proper diversity of other protected characteristics? Um, I think that's a statable position. I'm, I'm not sure that things are quite as straightforward as that. Um, for a number of reasons, in the first place, the other protected characteristics which you've listed, and I agree, the, the um, rate of appointment of people with those characteristics is going in the wrong direction, but they are shared by men and women. I'm, I'm sorry, it's a straightforward point, um, but given that women make up more than 50% of the population, um, appointing women could and should also bring with it um, appointments of people who share other protected characteristics. Um, and the other th thing I, I think we shouldn't lose sight of is that the focus on gender equality has raised the profile of the whole issue of diversity, I think, in a positive way. Um, so it's a bit of a mixed picture, I think. Perhaps uh, I've asked the question another way. Why is there... Is there an increase in underrepresentation of these other groups? I think, to try and give a simple answer as possible, um, I think it's simply that not enough quality applicants have come forward from these groups. And to develop that further, uh, before I hand over to Ian Bruce, who may be able to uh, give you more detail on it, um, attracting people to put themselves forward uh, involves um, effort on the part of those who are seeking to recruit. Uh, and best practice also involves the um, bodies involved, as well as the minister who's making the appointment, um, in outreach and trying to attract uh, people to put themselves forward for the board. Now, there is some work going on on that, and it, it is going on in relation to younger people, in relation to... Uh, visible BME uh, and also in relation to disabled people, but it hasn't yet borne fruit. And I, I think Ian would be able to give you a little bit more information on that. Sure, I'm happy to. Um, as Bill says, outreach is very important, uh, as is making the process accessible. You'll have seen the recommendations in the annual report that we made for the government. Um, so in relation to gender diversity, we have a very positive story to tell there. Um, when it comes to other groups, um, the picture is more complicated, and that's why the recommendations were about getting underneath these top-line figures. So um, lumping, for example, disabled people together into that 20% figure um, doesn't really give you a, a proper understanding of the particular barriers that are faced by people with disabilities. Um, and one of the things that I did say at the committee last year was it's quite important that we get boards involved in this activity as well. Um, so if you have a particular disability, you have a look at a board, um, you're not thinking just about the application process, you know, is that barrier free? You're not just thinking about whether or not the advert is attractive to you, the role is attractive to you. You're also thinking about what support will I have once I'm in post? Um, and that doesn't apply just to particular disabilities. Uh, I mean, equally, you know, if, if you're under 50 and you're a woman, you may have childcare responsibilities that you need to take into account, and you need to know that those are going to be accommodated by the board as well. So those are the sorts of discussions that we are having with the government and with boards um, to ensure that they are more accessible to people. So it really isn't just about the appointments process. It's a much wider thing. And the recommendations are about doing more in-depth research to identify specific barriers and how we can take those away. And, and there are a whole range of things in train at the moment. Um, so not just the research, the government has um, tasked the analytical services 
wing, I think is the term that Bill used um, to do that research in terms of the um, appointments process, uh, and that, that's very, very helpful. Um, but equally, we have some research with boards themselves underway at the moment, um, so it was really just starting when the last annual report was published. But that's been fascinating, um, about sort of two-thirds of boards have joined up um, to participate in the research, um, and it asks some questions of them about um, what particular barriers they believe they have to harnessing diversity, what particular activities they engage in um, to address those barriers. Um, it's all being done on a confidential basis, but, but ultimately what we are going to do is roll out the recommendations that, that arise from that, because it's clear that boards are doing things to make uh, participation um, much more accessible for people. Um, and that's being done in tandem with outreach. So if I can give you an example, um, last Monday evening, the Scottish Government ran a, a Come On Board event, uh, and that was done in association with women on boards. There were about 70 people in attendance. Two board chairs were there, two board members were there. Um, questions asked from the floor. Um, you know, there was someone who um, was a wheelchair user asked about you know whether or not support would be available in the event they were appointed. Someone else with childcare responsibilities asked a similar question. One of the board members from the Scottish Children's Reporter Administration spoke very openly. He's currently um, a lecturer, um, works full time, um, and he spoke about the fact that he's able to join. Um, board activities uh, via video conference. Um, he's the chair of the audit committee. All the other members of that audit committee are retired, so they, are, they completely rearranged everything that they do in order to come to him for the audit committee to be run. So it, it are these small, specific things that individual boards do that make it more accessible? I don't know if that helps. Thank you. Thank you. Patrick? Thanks very much. Good morning. Um, just moving on to the, the issue of uh, complaints and um, the, the volume of, of workload uh, on, on that, it has reduced again. Uh, I think last year we recognised that it had, it had increased the number of, of complaints from the low 20s to, I think, 30, uh, and it's come back down again. Um, I think last year when we had this discussion, uh, you weren't convinced that there was any connection there to the electoral cycle uh, to the idea that because there was a, a run-up to the election, that might have been generating uh, complaints that were politically motivated. Uh, has the, the reduction since then, since the, the last year, uh, changed your, your view on that? Do you, do you have any reason or, or uh, suggestion as to why the complaint level has, has reduced again? There were, um, convener, <clears throat> in 2016-17, so after the election to the parliament, um, the, we did receive a handful of complaints um, about newly appointed members from those who had been involved in the political process uh, during the election, but that doesn't explain fully the, the difference in numbers. Um, interestingly, in the current financial year, um, I'm not sure if this is the right adjective, but we're slightly ahead of where we were at the same time last year. You mean a, so, a slightly higher volume of Yes, so the numbers in, fluctuate. Um, I, I don't think there are specific reasons related mm. or readily linked to the electoral cycle. Okay. And as I think I said last year, there have been elections or a referendum or something major every <laughs> year since I've been in posts. <laughs> it's difficult to tell. Making, <clears throat> making no predictions there. Um, I, if, the, if the volume of complaints isn't predictable in that way and doesn't follow any, any kind of pattern uh, but fluctuates, uh, what does that mean in terms of your, your workload, your capacity, uh, your, your planning for being able to handle complaints on the, an appropriate timescale? It, it has an impact on budgeting, obviously. Um, your concern on this committee, obviously, is specifically complaints about members of this parliament. Yeah. Um, the numbers, the total numbers involved are small. Um, even at their highest, we're talking about 30 complaints, um, the majority of which don't require full investigation because they're not admissible or they're excluded from my jurisdiction. Um, so that particular part of it um, doesn't have a major impact. Um, 
But it's also true in relation to complaints about councillors and members of public bodies where the numbers are much higher. Okay. Um, and that does create a problem. Um, the solution that was adopted um, until um, this year was that we had an agreed level of investigating hours, if I can put it that way, which was budgeted for, plus a contingency figure, a reasonably significant contingency figure. Um, the level of investigating hours was unduly low, so we have, up till now, always had to call on the contingency. Um, we've agreed with the corporate body to submit a budget on a more, in my view, realistic basis for the financial year to come. Um, and then I suppose the risk transfers to me to try and manage it within the budget. And the, 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 the process of, of reaching the view that a, a particular complaint is inadmissible, is that relatively quick and painless or does it involve a certain amount of investigation? To, to, they to vary a lot, convener. Um, some of them are patently outside the scope of the code. Mm -hmm. um, if I can give you an example without any names, um, there was an individual who had a particular view on energy policy uh, and approached two MSPs looking for support for this person's view, and they didn't agree. So the complaint was about the failure of the leader of the party to discipline the two MSPs who had failed to agree with this individual's view on energy policy. Now, that's patently outside the code. Mm. Um, that was easily dismissed. Um, others raise um, issues which are purely legal or are legal in terms of interpretation of the code um, because the code is not 100% specific. It, it would be endlessly long if it was. Um, these can be quite difficult. Um, and on occasions, we have to get a certain amount of evidence as well to make the stage one assessment uh, as to whether the complaint is admissible. Um, up to now, we have managed that within the two months allowed in the legislation. Um, I intend to continue that if possible. Okay, thank you very much. Claire, you wanted to come in on this issue? Um, yeah, thank you, convener. I think possibly you've answered uh, part of it, but I was reflecting on, at the beginning, in response to questions from the convener, you talked about the budget and you referred again about um, there being challenges in, in managing the budget. I suppose that goes back to the question about IT as well. I was a bit concerned that you said there's a lack of IT specialism within uh, the Commissioner's office. I was thinking this day and age that's kind of to be expected and you would think there should be resources available to bring in IT specialism when it's actually quite a big project. I wouldn't expect a smaller organisation to have that capacity given IT. So that's a bit an additional a question you might want to address around why that's not being taken forward. But the line of question that Patrick Harvey was <coughs> uh, pursuing you did say it wasn't many complaints, 30 complaints. There are only 129 MSPs, so I do have some, it's quite a high proportion of the number of MSPs. But I wasn't sure, given you said the, there were those many complaints, but only six were admissible, if it's possible to do a, a bit more so it's clear to people what your role is and where cases might be admissible. Now, you've explained some of them are quite easily dismissed. Other ones, though, are taking up resources of the office and taking up investigative time to maybe come to the conclusion that it's likely to come to the conclusion that it's not admissible, given it's only six out of the overall number. I don't know if more could be done in, in possibly in that area. Uh, Convene, I think it's a fair point. Um, I, I am in the process of um, revamping the um, leaflet in which we have. Or, uh, it, it's available in paper form, but it's on our website as well, um, about MSP complaints. The difficulty is um, some people are patently incensed by something which has happened. Um, and in some cases, it may be something that has been said or done in the media, or it may be something which uh, an elected member has said when they're clearly involved in party political um, activities, for example, um, during an election. Um, and they wish to complain, and because of the title of my office, which is awful, by the way, but. Um, um, because they think I'm the Commissioner for Ethical Standards, anything that they perceive to be unethical has to be addressed um, here, which is, mm. in one sense, fair. Um, and I don't think it's reasonable for me, uh, or even for 
this committee or the Parliament to expect that those who are minded to complaint should be fully familiar with the MSP code and the ins and outs of it. Um, so it, it's difficult, I think, to have material which is sufficiently clear and readily understood, but also sufficiently specific um, to discourage people who might be minded to put in a complaint that's simply irrelevant. It, it is quite difficult to get that balance right. Um, and you also have to take account of whether people are comfortable reading materials um, either on paper or, or on the web. Um, the code itself is, even in its newly simplified form, it's relatively impenetrable um, unless you understand the, the organisation and its processes. I have sort of apologies if I've missed this in, in the report. Could you say the amount of complaints, do they generally then come from members of the public rather than within the parliament or from political parties? Is uh, it, the is vast it, majority, it's not in the report, uh, it's a fair question. The, the vast majority of them come from members of the public who may or may not be politically active. I, I don't follow that because motivation isn't really uh, an issue as far as I'm concerned. Um, every year we have a couple of complaints, I'm sorry not to be more specific, uh, which mm -hmm. come from one member about another member. But that's a minority of the It is the a minority, yeah, so, distinct okay. minority. Thank you. Kate, you wanted to come in? Just a, a, a brief question. Um, your report mentions <laughs> that uh, disrespect as a, a, a reason for complaint is growing as a percentage of the total. Now, I should caveat that by saying I'm not sure if that just refers to councils, because that's perhaps what the report was suggesting, but disrespect is growing. However, some conduct which might be considered disrespectful in another context is nevertheless permitted in a political context. Why, why is that number rising? I can't answer that, convener. Um, I'm pleased to say that in the current financial year, the percentage of complaints relating to disrespect in terms of what people have said about other people has gone down. Um, I described it at a previous committee as having reached the, I didn't use this word, but the zenith of its blossoming. Um, I, and I hope, I hope it is now fading. Um, I don't know. Um, and you would think, perhaps, that given the preponderance of unpleasant things being said on social media, um, many of them I appreciate about elected members, um, that there might be more complaints. Um, thankfully, that hasn't grown to a huge proportion either. Most of it is about what has been said, and it, the, the bulk of them are about council meetings, what has been said in or around council meetings, <coughs> or occasionally in less formal meetings involving councillors. Um, I can't recall any involving MSPs of that nature. I may be wrong, but I can't recall any at the moment. Thank you. Uh, Alexander. Thank you, convener. With the commencement of the Lobbying Act, uh, what impact do you see that having on your workload and your work practices? Um, convener, I've, I, I had to put some information in the financial memorandum uh, or submit the information for the mm -hmm. financial memorandum. At that point, um, the advice I had was that it was unlikely that there would be a large number of complaints. Um, and I'm st I haven't received any other advice. Um, I don't think it will have much impact in the year ahead. I appreciate that the, the lobbying regime doesn't actually come in until March of 2018, so I can't imagine it having any real impact in this financial year other than preparation, which we are involved in. Um, but in the following year, the risks, from my point of view, are that there are complaints about failure to register lobbying. Now, given that people have six months in which to update the register, um, that would push it to halfway through the year mm -hmm. at the earliest. Um, or that there are complaints about the registrations which people have made as lobbyists. Um, and given that the system is now open on a trial basis, um, I would hope that the number of complaints of that category would be fairly small. But, but I have no yeah. um, hard information on which to base the assessment. But, but you, have, you, have, you have got some kind of contingency there. Just 
to try and anticipate what may happen. Indeed, Convener, I've allowed a certain sum in my budget bid for one or two uh, complaints having to be investigated fully, um, and also for some of the preparatory work, which, as I say, we have already started. Uh, and thankfully, we've been involved in quite a lot of the discussions that are going on behind the scenes. So I'm, I'm, I'm I think, reasonably up to speed with how it's developing. Thank you, Kevin. Yeah, Jamie. Uh, thank you, Kavina. Um, I didn't want to kind of include this when we were talking about um, diversity, wider diversity, but um, uh, I, I'm a Highlands Islands MSP, and I just wanted to uh, kind of find out what regional geographical diversity there was in appoint uh, appointments, uh, kind of what the barriers might be to that, and what can be done to ensure that kind of all Scotland is represented on, on some of these boards. I think Ian's probably in a better position to answer that than I am. To sure. detail. Um, it is one of the things that we gather. Uh, in terms of monitoring information. Uh, I, I am afraid I don't have the figures with me today, but uh, I'm sure we'll be very happy to provide those That'd to you fair. and to the committee in due course. Um, you're absolutely right. I mean, it is something that's that's considered. Um, territorial health boards, probably a good example. So generally, what they do is they, they look for people um, with a live interest and a stake in provision in that given area. Um, for national bodies, um, not so much. Um, and I think, generally speaking, there's possibly a preponderance of people from the central belt. But we will get the figures for you um, and, and provide them to you in due course. Um, there are other agencies, so Highlands and Islands Enterprise would be an example mm -hmm. where, you know, generally they will look for people with um, live knowledge of the issues that affect people in those given areas. But uh, we'll get the figures for you. That would, that would be very helpful. I was just wondering if there are things that we could do to kind of ensure that um, the, the, the meetings are more accessible and therefore people can put themselves forward for these boards, whether it's video conferencing or, yeah. or, or when meetings are scheduled, where they're scheduled, that kind of thing. Yes, absolutely. Uh, and it is something that we recommend um, in our discussions with the boards of public bodies. One of the things that we hope to do uh, as a result of the research is roll out um, recommendations about all the accessible practices that are already underway. There are, you know, I know already because we've had a lot of returns and um, there are lots of instances of good practice, um, but there's not necessarily a forum for those to be rolled out. Um, one of the things, so a lot of the good practice activity that I mentioned earlier has become embedded uh, and one of those is um, regular networking events between chairs. And there they do discuss how they harness diversity on an informal basis. And that's great. You know, um, Bill and I attend those um, two, three times a year. Um, it's been set up, set up by the Scottish Government. Uh, and there's also a governance hub, um, which is new, that's been established by the Public Bodies Unit. And it includes um, advice on things like, you know, how boards go about succession planning. Um, but you're absolutely right. I think there is more that could be done um, to, to bring you know, everyone in. Um, I mentioned to the Commissioner um, prior to our meeting today, so I met with Equate Scotland last week. Uh, their particular focus is younger women in science, engineering and technology. We've already agreed with them to run a couple of sessions um, next year. This will be in March, uh, again, to encourage applications from people that we want applications from. Um, Equate were very clear this time we're going to head up to Aberdeen. Yeah. I've been in touch with Food Standard Scotland, which is, you know, one of the few public bodies based um, outside the central belt, other than the territorial ones. Um, I've already got, uh, in principle, agreement from them that they would love to host this event. So that's something that we're going to be doing in March. So it's not as though it's off our radar. It yeah. certainly is. Yeah. That's very helpful. It. Thank yeah. you. Not at all. Clear. Oh, thank you, convener. Um, the you will be aware, as well as the Lobbying Act coming uh, down the line, there is um, a lot of discussion in Parliament around sexual harassment issues, and the committee, the corporate body, the Prime Officer has taken an interest in this. And there are a number of, um, I suppose, different approaches. There's quite a few different streams. If a complaint comes forward, how it is dealt with, whether it comes from a political, within a political party or within the Parliament. Um, and so do you, um, as a body, anticipate any additional uh, workload, or are you preparing a need for additional capacity or knowledge around this particular area of concern? Um, convener, uh, unless the code is changed, um, my remit in this area will stay as it is. Um, so if there were to be any <coughs> increase in complaints, th that would be down to, I think, 
well, it, it could be um, it could be an indication of uh, uh, poorer behaviour. I think that is unlikely in the current climate. So it would be more likely down to people feeling more inclined to make a complaint. Mm -hmm. um, the invest. Oh, sorry. sorry. No, sorry. I was about to interrupt, but carry on. No, on you go. It's all right. No, I was going to, I don't know if it's um, if you feel it's appropriate to answer this the question, but do you feel that the code is clear enough around these type of issues? Do you have any, I mean, it's not too specific to say, have you had any complaints around this area come in through the code? I don't know if you're able to... Um, I obviously wouldn't be able to talk about anything specific. that was current. Um, I have not had any complaints under this issue. As a historical um, if they were to occur, in terms of my remit, uh, I think they would be in relation to um, lack of respect, mm -hmm. which was discussed at another committee last mm -hmm. week. Um, respect can mean a lot of different things, um, but if somebody uh, were minded to make a complaint about sexual harassment, which fell within my remit, then I think that would be the basis for it. Um, and in terms of what we're doing, I'm not proposing to increase our staffing in any way in order to deal with complaints which come in. They would be dealt with um, as part of our business. Um, the one thing I am uh, setting out to do is to make sure that we have links in place and information which would allow us, if we needed to, or we thought it was helpful, um, to um, point anybody involved in it in the right direction if they needed support. Um, mm -hmm. Because my office, my role is investigatory, um, I, I cannot provide support to one side or another in an investigation that would be seen as, um, well, for start I'm not qualified, but uh, it would be seen as taking sides, which or could be seen that way, which could undermine the independence of the investigation. So all that we can do um, if we think it would be helpful, is advise people that they could make contact with here or there with as appropriate. Mm -hmm. So it is. Um, so the code of, where you think it might be relating to code of practice around description of lack of respect. For me, that would suggest the code does need some clarity. That's quite a broad um, definition of where sexual harassment might fall within. Um, I'd imagine, it's all conjecture here at the moment, as you say, you've not had cases brought forward that are that have already been dealt with. So I would imagine doing an investigation around the wording lack of respect, uh, would would that be challenging? It's quite a responsibility to put on, to think this is the definition we're working with. It's a select, sexual harassment case, but it falls under lack of respect. To do an investigation around that, I'd imagine, would be quite challenging to make that judgment or... Um, what is it? I do agree, convener. It is quite challenging, potentially. Um, I think it would be inappropriate for me, both as an investigator rather than the, the person in charge of the policy here, but also ahead of your own inquiry, um, t to say much more about the, the code uh, and its potential effectiveness. But I'm obviously happy to contribute at an appropriate point, yeah. if you see that. Uh, That's helpful, thank appropriate. you. It's been helpful to have clarity from the Commissioner that lack of respect is currently where it would fall within. So That's thank you my understanding, that. Convener. Yeah. Thank you. I'm sure the Committee will be very keen to hear from you during the course of, of our inquiry. Um, I've not had an indication that there are any... Oh, sorry, Clay. Yeah, there was one other question just around the length of time it's taken between dates of interviews and... Yeah people being informed of the outcome. I think the report said that that's increased recently. Is it, what are the, the reasons behind that? Or is it? Um, convener, I, I don't have information on the reasons. Um, th this information is based on statistics which are supplied mm -hmm. to my office by, by the government. Um, on the positive side, um, even as extended there within the outer limit that, that was agreed um, some time back, um, obviously it would be better if the periods could be shortened um, for what it's worth, um, in the current year, the number of appointment rounds in progress has gone up significantly from the previous year, and that will obviously put pressure on those who are involved in the system. Um, so I'm, I, I don't know whether they're able to make progress uh, on that front or not. It's not something I can influence. I, I, I'm not, I don't have any guidance or anything on that uh, other than just reporting on the statistics as, as given to us. By the government. 
Okay, thank you. Um, I've not had any indication that any other committee members have questions, so I'd like to thank uh, Bill Thompson and Ian Bruce for their evidence today and formally close the meeting.